if I told you my story. Hey everybody, welcome back. Beautiful day today. I've got a special guest with me today. Joan Lyerly is a dear, dear friend of mine, and not just a friend, but really her family is our family. Uh, my wife and I have bonded with uh, Joan and Jeff Lyerly um, over the years, and we consider them like literally family to us. And so uh, today, Joan is with me, and she's going to share, and I'm not sure what it is, either a story um, about how God has answered prayer, or just talk to me about your prayer life. So I'm going to turn this over now to Joan, and she's going to give you a little bit of background about herself and uh, about how she serves God, and then get into the story. So Joan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've been a Christian <laughs> since 1973. Um, I was a single mom, meandering through this world with no purpose, and Jesus snatched me up in 1973. And... Um, like all of us, we've never been the same since that point. So 73, I think I was only two years out of training wheels or something. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> so um, yeah, I met him in 1973 as a single mom. And it was the simplest of things. I had, I had no, uh, no spiritual leading or guiding or interest until my brother became a Christian and started telling me about Jesus and I saw the changes in his life and and he kept trying to um, share the Lord with me and I wasn't going to have it. At least that's what I let him think. But something inside of me started waking up and I was hungry for something, for a purpose in my life. And so <laughs> with, without any drama, I just said one night, Jesus, if you're there, I need you. If you're not, I'm talking to the wall. And it was just that, that's all it took. I mean, that's the beauty of Jesus is that he just, his invitation doesn't require anything formal or um, amazing like that. It was just that simple. I needed him and he came and he, he met that need. And um, so since 1973, I've just been involved in different churches in different roles within churches and in, in leadership sometimes in just in service, sometimes in nothing. Um, I did go into a billboard ministry. I was building billboards years ago in Falls Church. Um, and I love that. But it's just been, God has just had me on different paths doing different things for all these years. You know, it's so funny, I, how, like over the years uh, that I've known you, um, we've oftentimes sat around and I'll, um, my wife and I will bring up stories about you know, things we've been involved in. And I don't, I can't remember a single time where you have not said, oh yeah, I've been there or, <laughs> or I know them, right? Because you are, you have been like seriously, and, and, and I mean this, um, you know, um, in a very honest way, like you, you've always, like you strike me as uh, someone who's always been very devoted to serve God. And, um, and so a lot of times people might think, oh, sure, she's been there. Sure, she's done that. Well, that's what happens when you're, and your heart is really given over to God. And so I've always looked up to that, uh, honestly. Uh, you've inspired me um, in many ways. So, um, but, so let's get into the meat of this. The reason I've asked you here today, which you know, is to share with us right, a story or, um, or something about God, about your prayer life. So why don't you share with me? Um, well, I'll share both, but I'll try to make them brief. But I've had a couple of mind-blowing things that have happened in my life that could be from no other source, but God himself and his grace and his mercy. Um, number one, of course, my son, who you know, Matthew, um, who was an alcoholic for 22 years. I have three sons and God gave me a promise from Isaiah 49 um, in the early nineties. And Matthew was just a little one by then. It was, it was the, the, the prayer, the promise that was given to me from Isaiah was so beautiful and, and I loved it, but I didn't see that I was going to need it. So God even gave me a promise before I really needed to hang on to it. And then when um, I have three sons and um, but Matthew is the youngest and he became an alcoholic and I, I didn't. I, and then I realized I needed that promise. And the more I 
it was like every time I started getting worried and concerned, would he wreck the car? Would he hurt somebody? Would he kill him? It was like that promise was what held me up. It was, it was like there was no need to be concerned because God had it. He already knew my future. He knew the future of my son. I didn't need to worry. And so, as you know, a year ago, Matthew um, came back out of that and um, he's serving in the church now. And he's, he's got a long road. You can't be an alcoholic for 22 years and not have a, still a sure. long road ahead. But God has proven himself to me so beautifully that he's so worthy of my trust and my adoration. In terms of prayer, I think prayer is an interesting thing. It's just prayer is like our relationship with the Lord and our prayer life is very much like children. I mean, when I first became a Christian, I took um, my vacation time to just read the Bible and I just it was so satisfying. I was so hungry and I was reading the word, this thing that had never been important to me, this thing that always seemed dry and dusty, all of a sudden was like a pop-up picture book for me. It's like the characters came alive in this, in this beautiful book. And um, I fell in love with Jesus and I fell in love with his words. But it, you go through seasons when you have children and you're busy raising children, you don't have a lot of time to set aside and spend time with God. You just, you just don't. But God knows that he gave us these children. So that's not a mystery to him. You do the best you can. You set aside time and even that gets wrecked. And there are times you go through and, and you don't pray for a while. You just, you're, you're hanging on by your fingernails, just trying to get through life. But you, but you always know he's there. You just always sense that he's there. And, and, um, and then as you get older and you, and you spend more time with him, it's like you crave more time with him. And now I'm 75, I'm retired. It's actually in terms of prayer and, and study, it is the best time because I can get up and spend as much time as I want. And I think the thing that's changed um, with me in prayer is that um, I was always been, about 10 years ago, I discovered a guy named Brother Lawrence, who was a monk um, who wrote letters to some people in the 1600s. And it was called uh, Practicing the Presence of God. Yes. And that book, I mean, I've had several books. C.S. Lewis has had a great impact on me, but that one little book by that monk, that little skinny book, the practice of the presence of God has had the greatest impact. I started reading it every year and I started noticing the last couple of years, I read it more frequently because I don't want to just have a prayer time. I want to have a prayer life. Mm. I want to spend time dedicated to the, to the word and sit and read the word and, and, um, and I need the Holy Spirit to even make the word come alive and make sense to me. But then even as I leave my prayer chair, I want to continue abiding in pr the, his presence. And I'm finding that that is sort of a, a practice that you have to be conscious of having an ongoing conversation with him yeah. throughout your day. That so when you leave that chair, nothing really changes. You're still in a conversation with him. Sure. And so I guess with me, the word abiding has become sort of my buzzword. I mean, we all hear, and I know it's in the FBI or somewhere, it's like the truth will set you free. And I so often want to shake people and go, read the first part. It, you read, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I want to abide in his word. Mm. That's my thing. And, and in Psalms, he says, um, he who dwells, in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And that's what I want to do. I want to abide in the shadow of yeah. the Almighty all day long. I want to, I mean, I know that I am. I, sure. I am whether I feel it or not, but, I, but now I want to be aware of it. And so that's sort of become my, I don't know, in the last year or so, that's become my thing is the practice of the presence of God, where I leave the chair and I have conversation with him all day about, I make jewelry, I make skincare, I make all, I find that I have conversation with him all day long. 
And it wow. is that's it's sweet. fabulous. Yeah, that's awesome. It's fabulous. It's just like having a running conversation with your best friend. All hey, the let, time. Me, let me ask you something. So let's, so let's go back for a minute um, to <clears throat> the promise uh, from Isaiah that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, I know the background of this because you've shared it with us for years, right? <laughs> a thousand times. And we've, and so um, would you actually elaborate on that? Like, how did you come to find that promise in Isaiah? Do you have it memorized or do you want to open it up and read I'm it? Sure open right? it you know, up. Sad as many times as I've so, said the promise <laughs> and, and actually not only just said the promise to other people, I've said it to, to, to God. It's like, I'll say, but you promised father, you promised Isaiah 49, 24. So listen, the only reason I'm going to say this um, right now, what I'm about to say is because, you know, we our, our lives, our families have been interconnected for a long time. And I've um, I've heard and actually uh, read this and prayed over it um, too, right, in support of you and your family over. Oh, that's great. Over Matthew, right? Yeah. But um, so how, first of all, how did how did this promise come to your knowledge? Like, how did you discover it? And second of all, how long? did it take you standing on that promise? In 1994, Jeff and I were attending a church in Percival, a little church, and a couple came, and I think they were speaking at the church, the, at least the husband was. But the wife, I had three sons, and Matthew was just, I mean, what was he? Just, he was a little guy, he was under 10. And so no problems there. And the other boys were, they were in, I mean, I, I wasn't concerned about things. And this lady came up to me. I didn't even know her. And she said, God wants me to give you a word. He wants to give me, give you a promise mm -hmm. to hold on to. It says, can the prey be taken from the mighty man or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? Surely thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty man will be taken away and the prey of the tyrant will be rescued for I will contend with the one who contends with you and I will save your sons. And I, at the time, I thought that was so sweet, but I didn't see the application. But I believed her that she didn't know me, and I believed her that um, God wanted to give me something to hold on to. I just didn't realize how much I needed to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as the years went by, it became obvious, and I sometimes, Matthew would be out and he would be drinking or, or I wouldn't even know where he was or something. And I would just get down on my knees and I would read this to him and I'd just say, Father, this is what you told me. And you must have known that I needed it. And um, you gave me this promise. And if you gave me this promise, then you're good. And it's up to you to fulfill it. And I mean, not, not only Matthew, but even my oldest son who met the Lord at a very young age, but kind of walked away, got involved, had wife, children, built a business, and he was all wrapped up in his business and everything. And I look at this now and he said, I'll save your sons, all of them. And I'm like, <laughs> this <part."> yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, this was for all of my boys. And, yeah. um, I know that other versions, you know, say your children, and that's that's really what it means. But I mean, in this version, it was my sons, and I have three sons. And um, so I look at it as it was for all of my kids, but not just for my kids. It was for me to know that they were captives being held by a tyrant and that I had been a captive held by a tyrant and that he set us free from the tyrant. And... Um, so yeah, I know you've heard this a million times and, and it never gets old. It never Listen, gets old. It, it, it never gets old. Many years as I read this, you would think I would have been able to spit it out like that. <laughs> but it's almost like I can't. It's almost like right. God wants me to just open the book again, hold it up and say, Look, this is what you wrote to me. So listen, we've watched my family has walked with your family a long time and I have watched my wife and I have watched God perform a miracle just in the last year, year and a half. <sighs> with Matthew, right? And um, and I can't even count how many prayers we've put up for him, but it's probably dwarfed by the ones that you and Jeff have put up over the years, just insane, right? Um, but your faith is being rewarded. Um, I believe that. So, man, this is, um, I wish we had time to get in deeper in this topic, but you know, what I wanna do, if, if you don't mind, 
Um, Can I just say sure, one thing? Yeah. Real yeah. quick. Sure. I think when he gives a promise and, and, and you invite other people into that promise, and like you all prayed and others prayed, I mean, we were a small group for years that prayed, it's like God shares that, and it's not just for me. Then it becomes a shared, a shared um, fulfillment of of a, of a promise, and it encourages other people. Just like other people whose children came back to the Lord. Every time I heard, I was encouraged. So these things are not just for us; they're for the body. Sure, they're for the body. So I'm and we, sorry, go ahead. And we need that tight community around us too yes. of believers. Like, you know, uh, people can't see uh, behind the cameras, but uh, Dave Firestone is behind the cameras uh, making all this um, not possible. But him and his wife, I mean, they've been present through this too and, and joining in the prayer. So there's a, always a community around, yes. you know, around these uh, these huge struggles. Yeah. So so let me get to... Um, let me get to another uh, very important part of uh, these interviews, and that is if you had um, some advice to give to, let's say, a new believer or someone who's, you know, who's been attending church a long time, maybe just has never seen the value of prayer because they've just never tried it, whatever it is, what advice would you give to encourage people to pray and pray like you do? Desperation for one. I mean, because... If you believe God, you believe he's a rewarder of those who seek him. That's what he says. Hmm. And when we pray, we're seeking his face. And our prayer, we know that he already knows us, but we get to know this father. We get, have a, we get a deeper, intimate relationship with him. Um, I think also the value of prayer is that some people will see something and they'll go, oh, it's a coincidence. But if you have prayer, you see the Father's foot, fingerprints on, on these things that happen in your life in a different way. You don't see them as coincidences. You see them as your Father loving you back. And mm -hmm. um, Now, I think, you know, like when I think of you, right, uh, I think of someone who is not just um, offered up a lot of prayers, but someone that who has offered up probably more prayers than I can wrap my mind around. Like, honestly, I mean, over the years, like you're, you're one of those people that just prays, right? And stands on those prayers, like in belief. So where, where do you think is most important when, when people are struggling on how to pray? Does it matter about the words you pick? Does it matter about the format, whether you're on your knees or standing? Like, you know, like where's the important part? Where's the key part about prayer that makes it so powerful? Intention. Mm. I think that's the only thing I can think of is intention. Um, like I always say, the three. It doesn't matter about your sure. body position. I know some people go on their knees. Uh, my knees hurt, so I don't do that a whole <laughs> lot. God's okay with that, you know. Um, he just wants to have a relationship with us. And he, you know, um, I would just say, time and prayer to get to know your father and believing his word and believing that this is he's this is god breathes and so he's speaking back to us mm -hmm. sometimes he speaks back to me in other ways but most often it's through his word pray as you read his word sure. you yeah. have to pray as you read his word i, I was you know it's funny I've, I'm, I've said this a million times but um there are plenty of there are a lot of components to powerful prayer uh, the, there are three that jump out at me that are, I, that for me, are very powerful. Um, that that I I always say really need to be present um, when you pray to God, and they are uh, hunger, humility, and honesty. Yes, it, honesty. Like literally, you can roll a bunch of other things into that, but if if any one of those three are missing, um, hey, it's not a secret formula. I'm just telling you. A genuine prayer is going to contain those three things: a hunger for God to 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 come into my situation, a humility of knowing, remembering who it is that you're speaking to, and knowing that He's the one who can answer it, not you. And then, um, it, it, and so, a lot of times we forget that because in our time of desperation, we're just like it's almost like demands: oh. do this, do this, do this. 
And so we miss it, right? The opportunity to just think about who we're talking to. No, I think and the I, point about humility. Is and I've learned this from you over the years. I've actually learned this from you uh, by hearing how you pray. So, well, listen, we're, um, unfortunately, we are bound by uh, uh, the universe and <laughs> um, uh, the enemy to wrap this up. Yes. So um, it's a tradition um, that I have um, kind of instituted here in these interviews. Uh, to ask the interviewee, the guest, to close us in prayer. So would you uh, do us the honor? Yes, I us? absolutely will. Thank you. Father, it is so sweet to have this time to share how important you are in our lives and how valuable it is that you want to walk with us every day. I thank you for these men who also want to extol you and, and how important it is how you are crying out for a relationship with us you sent your son to die so that we could have this we should never take this lightly and what gordon said about humility lord i thank you so much that we have to realize that we have nothing but humility because you're the god of the universe you made us you created us you love us you've created an eternity for us to live with you in and lord with honesty Lord, I pray that we would all be honest before you. We'd pour out our, our broken, broken bits in our life, Lord. And I thank you that you're the God who hears and you're the God who puts us back together and that there's no condemnation with you for we are in Christ Jesus. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen. If I told you my story, you would hear hope, they wouldn't let